You know, there are a lot of different passages that we have to deal with in the Word of God concerning divine order, and now we're on the topic of concerning women and the propriety of them speaking in the assembly and the propriety of them being in ministry, but the best place that we should begin, and it's the beginning place, it's the first place, is in the book of Genesis, chapters 1, 2, and 3. This is the place where you have to turn if you want to settle this matter in your own mind as to the nature and gifts, callings, roles, and so forth of men and women. Now, we aren't the only ones who would turn here. Those people who are in favor of unscriptural attitudes toward women speaking and toward women in ministry also attempt to turn back here, and we'll see how they do that maybe in some of the later studies. It's, in one sense, beyond me how you could turn back to Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 and end up teaching the superiority of women. But I have heard some of the most demonically inspired doctrines you could imagine which have come right from Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 concerning roles of men and women, especially concerning roles of women. And I've heard it in formal academic type uh, settings and contexts, and I've heard it elsewhere as well, and it is rather amazing. But we're going to be turning to the story as it is recorded by Moses in Genesis, Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. Uh, it's certainly appropriate to turn back here, not just for a study of women in general, uh, but women in ministry and women in the church speaking and questions like this. It's appropriate, I say, because Paul does on three different occasions whenever he's dealing with a woman issue. Paul himself, who was an Old Testament theologian and scholar, would return to the Old Testament narrative found here in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 on several occasions when he's dealing with this whole question. I mean, we have to go to Scripture for the answer to our questions or to our problems or to the issues that are confronting us and that surround us then as well as today. And Paul, on three occasions, when he dealt with the question of men and women in 1 Corinthians 11, surprise, he returns to Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Whenever he deals with the question of women speaking in the assembly in 1 Corinthians 14, surprise, he returns to Genesis 1, 2, and particularly chapter 3. When he deals with the question of women speaking and women in ministry in 1 Timothy 2, surprise again. He goes back to Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. So there must be something fixed and normative that means transcultural. That means that you can't just say that was a Corinthian situation or an Ephesian situation. There's something fixed and normative. Normative means that's it. That's the norm throughout all cultures, all generations, Jew, Gentile, black, white. There's something, because we all came from Adam and Eve. All cultures and all uh, types of people came from Adam and Eve. There is something fixed and normative about the creation narrative that means that the teaching there is applicable across the cultures, it's transcultural, down through the ages, from the beginning of time until today. It's applicable for today, and then it becomes an aid for discussing the propriety of women teaching in the church, speaking in the church, and women in ministry. Rather than turning to Genesis 3, I guess I would like to start over in those passages, for those of you that aren't as familiar as others, 1 Corinthians 11 in the first place, where we see that in these three big chapters, and these are the three sections of them, let's say at least, 1 Corinthians 11 and 14 and 1 Timothy 2, where Paul is dealing with the so-called woman question, with the woman issue. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 14, and 1 Timothy 2. And Paul's trying to give the biblical view the apostolic view, the view of the apostles, the view of Christ, the view that he is going to say is supported by the Old Testament revelation itself. And because he writes what he writes, called 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy, it becomes New Testament doctrine and truth as well. But lest anybody entertain, and here's where people are, and this is one of the first points we'll be getting into here in a moment, lest anybody entertain the notion that by some mysterious rearrangement, of the sexes or of the genders that Christianity 
has done something to women that Christianity has somehow freed them from who they are or what they are or what they were made to be lest anyone entertain that notion Paul is saying it goes back to the very beginning that that's not the way that God has made man and woman and he gives it to us in New Testament revelation you see quoting the old to be sure referring to the old yes but it's in the new in other words a lot of people are under the delusion that women were inferior and they weren't but they were inferior in the Old Testament and they were kept in subjection and they weren't allowed to do this and that's because that was a Hebrew a cultural patriarchal type setting and it was just a part of Near Eastern lifestyle and yet when you move to the West or to the Occidental lifestyle then we're talking about something different or you move beyond the cross and Jesus has set women free and so they're not under that that patriarchal type bondage that we think that we read in the Old Testament books but you see the Apostle Paul was saying that's not exactly the way that it is. The Jews weren't patriarchal in their culture just because that was a thing to do in the Near East. They were patriarchal because they were closer to the Genesis account, to the creation experience, than we are when we're living right now. And because they were closer to it in time, they happened to be closer to it in adherence as well and in obedience. As I've said, it's been really modern times we've seen this tremendous break, this ERA-type break of women away from what has traditionally been a woman's role. And whatever you want to make of the statement I just made, a woman's role, what is that? That she's to be, you know, seen and not heard? Well, no, not exactly. Your sons and your daughters can prophesy. Whatever people want to make of that, whatever other people have made of it unscripturally, you know, like I keep giving you the reference to the Islamic faith or to the Mohammedans you know they're certainly unscriptural in their approach and attitude toward women for you're really no more than a household slave there that's certainly not the biblical view either the Old or the New Testament and it is a surprise maybe to some people not that it's not the situation in the New but it's not the situation in the Old women had a lot more freedom than men <clears throat> there are some regards there are, there are various ways in which in the New Testament they have less freedom you could take the role of the prophetess when that's not allowed in the New Testament it was practiced by women in the old and then there are other ways in which maybe they were are freer in the new than they were in the, the old you see there are a lot of different views that people have and you know you're, it's like swinging at invisible flies you're having to bat so many different things at the same time let's try to stay on track then 1 Corinthians 11 and beginning with verse 3 I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God now these are chapters that the feminists don't really like to deal with the head of the woman is the man I don't know how far we'll get into the studies in the future but one husband and wife scholarly team has done an, you know, an in-depth study on this word head, H-E-A-D, head in Greek. Now, does that symbolize authority, like the traditional interpretation would be, that the head of the woman is the man? You know, he stands in a leadership, authoritative role, a headship role. Or does it mean something else? And they just give you all the wild statistics that they have. And someone else come along and said that, that they pull the statistics that they wanted to out of, you know, the papyri or whatever, and then they left the others that didn't, fit them that didn't suit their liking of the passage or their understanding of the passage every man pray or prophesy having his head covered dishonor now he's talking about head in a different way here physical head not headship the head of every man is Christ well Christ isn't a head <clears throat> like a skull with a brain in it and the head of Christ is God that God is a skull a brain something like that it's headship now he's talking about the literal head though <clears throat> every man praying or prophesying having his head covered dishonoreth his head but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head for that is even all one as if she were shaven in other words what he's saying is you just as soon go ahead and cut off your hair if you're not going to wear a head covering that's why we wear a head covering here why the women do the Bible teaches that Every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. Now, is he shifting meanings of head in the middle of that verse? Little head, the skull, the old hard thing on the top of the shoulders. The first head in verse 5, dishonoreth her head, her husband. Well, we'll get into that maybe later on. 
<clears throat> but if a woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, you know, to have short hair or shaved off hair, he said that's a shame, then let her be covered. And there are a couple of shames Paul speaks of. It's a shame for a woman to have a bald head or, as he goes on to say here, short hair. It's a shame to have short hair. It's a shame to speak in church. Remember, he said it's a shame for a woman to speak in church over in chapter 14. There are a couple of shames that Paul says here. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Now, do you not recognize Genesis 2 right there? The man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Remember, God took Adam's rib and made a woman out of it. So there's the creation. He's going back to Genesis 2 right there. You see, in dealing with, this is the important thing, in dealing in the New Testament, after the cross, during the period of grace, whatever you want to say about this period, after the cross, during the, the era of the Christian church, he goes back to the creation narrative because there's something fixed and normative there. And he returns to that in discussing the roles of men and women. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Paul is understanding Genesis 2 in such a way that it there's something fixed and normative about that that cannot be changed and that cannot be rearranged. People can attempt to. Doctrines of demons would have us do that, but it cannot be done, though. The man was not made for the woman. Remember, he was made first in chronological successive order. He was made first. He looked around for a companion, named the animals, and couldn't find a helper that was suitable for him. And so God made the woman for the man, not vice versa. Verse 10, For this calls off the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. We're not teaching from this chapter yet, which we will do later on. What does he mean for this cause? Was the cause preceding verse 10, or is it the cause that he lists in the end of verse 10? Or is it a combination of them? In other words, why should a woman wear a head covering? Because of the angels or because of the order of creation or both? See, it's a little ambiguous in verse 10. For this cause, well, what cause? Does the cause precede or does the cause follow? The giving of the statement that a woman ought to have power or a sign of authority on her head. Well, for this cause ought she be caused. Well, there's another cause. I guess it has to do at least in part with the fact that the angels somehow our observers. Nevertheless, neither is the woman with neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. Notice that little phrase there. We'll come back to that. Uh, for as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judging yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? So well, you know, I know a lot of people who are judging themselves and they would come up with a blank. <laughs> That's their problem. They live, in a, they live in a mixed up world in a mixed up society. He said, judging yourselves. You should be able to look and judge. Judging yourselves. Is it natural for two men to be married? Judging yourselves. You shouldn't have to have scriptural revelation. Is it natural for two women to have relations with one another? Judging yourselves. You know, we would say, well, yeah, we could judge. Well, there are a whole lot of people who can't judge that around us today. Amen. Well, you shouldn't have to have a proof text. Just judging yourselves. Is homosexuality or lesbianism right or normal? No. It's very weird and strange and abnormal. It's demonic. Judging yourselves. Can a woman pray to God without her head covered? Well, I would have drawn a blank, you said. Well, you just were raised in a blank world, a blankety-blank world. <laughs> Amen. Verse 14, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him? And don't try to get into, well, I wonder how long Jesus' hair was. That's the first thing people try to bring up here. Just stay with what the Word says. It's a shame. I don't care who has it. The Apostle Paul said it's a shame for a man to have long hair. He said, nature teaches you that. And by the way, what's your proof that the Lord had long hair? People get into all of that, and, and there's no proof. They don't have any proof. At least I've got something I, I, that I can prove. The Bible says this. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. I guess if it's a shame for a man to have long hair, Jesus didn't have long hair then. That's all there is to it. Where's your picture, you know, that would prove otherwise? It'd be something created in the 20th or 19th or 13th century, not the 1st century. 
If a woman have long hair, it's a glory to her. Verse 15, if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, then we have no such custom. That is, we don't have this custom of being contentious, neither any of the assemblies of God. I mean, just look at all that chapter contains there, that you would go to church a month of Sundays before you'd hear them get anywhere in the ballpark of anything in this chapter, except maybe the end when it talks about, you know, the communion. Long hair, men, women, head coverings, glory, hair length. Oh, what legalisms, what bondages people would tell us. They wouldn't get anywhere near 1 Corinthians 11. And headship and the woman was made for the man. You don't have to tell me. My husband keeps reminding me that all the time. <laughs> I wouldn't have to be told that. You know, someone would complain, so don't let me come to church and have it preached to me. I have to live it most of the time when I'm at home anyway. You know, they wouldn't get within a square mile of the first half of 1 Corinthians 11. It's packed full of information. Headship, roles, head covering, long hair, short hair on men and women. You know, you couldn't get away with that in a lot of churches. A few you can, but most of them you certainly couldn't. Well, I'm simply pointing out to you, in most of the verses here, you can tell the whole flavor is the creation narrative of Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. Then over in chapter 14, I won't say a lot about this passage because we'll say more about it later, and you'll become very familiar with these passages. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 and 35. I still say, friends, and I find it remarkable that, that here we are reading the Word of God, and what are people going to do with the Word of God? It's so plain. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it's not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Maybe what people would be better off doing is just admit that they don't like what Paul said. Rather than saying that he didn't say it and it doesn't mean what it says, just say, I don't like it. It doesn't feel good to me whenever I read that. But that's what he said. You can't get around that. Amen. Well, you can. You can't just say, well, I believe Paul was wrong. Well, we believe you're wrong, that Paul was wrong. That's what we believe. We don't believe Paul was wrong. If you think Paul's wrong, we think you're wrong. You're not inspired of the Holy Spirit. You're inspired of a wrong spirit whenever you say Paul was wrong. Amen. Now, I, I, I want to say something I forgot to say last time, the last time we were studying in this area. Do you remember that I was getting off in some of the background as to why charismatics have traditionally, they've been right about so many things. That's what makes them charismatic, is you got right about the Holy Spirit question. But traditionally, they have been dead wrong when it comes to women in ministry and women speaking in the church, they just let women do everything. Ordain them, the female evangelist, woman this, woman that. You know, just no holes barred as far as they're concerned. They have traditionally been wrong in that regard. And I explain various ways, various reasons why I think that they have been misguided and deluded in that area. Now, one good example would be the fact that there is a commentary set set of commentaries available, a very well-known one, the New International Commentary on the New Testament. It's been going on for I don't know how many years now, and they never have finished the set. And they've been going on so long that some of the first volumes published back in the 50s are now being redone, and they haven't even done the other volumes that haven't appeared for the first time. Now, now follow this for just a moment. And so there has come a new commentary out on 1 Corinthians. Because the Corinthians one was done, I think, in 52 or 56, 1956 or something like that. And so scholarship, you know, is outdated, and so you've got to write a new commentary on 1 Corinthians. And they chose as the commentator for this new volume on Corinthians an Assemblies of God. Now, most of the commentators are non-charismatic. An Assemblies, uh, ordained Assemblies of God minister, seminary professor, one I happen to know, he taught at a school where I attended for a while, world-renowned expert on textual matters and textual criticism. Now, now you think of that. World-renowned on New Testament textual criticism. You know what that means. You compare the manuscripts and try to find which ones are the most reliable ones. Now, remember what his background is. I'm going to give you a shocker here. Assemblies of God. Now, I say historically they've been wrong. They're in favor of women in ministry. And the Bible's not in favor. Paul said, I don't allow that. He said, it's a shame for a woman to speak in the church. They must be silent. 
All right, so here, this is a big thing, I think 850-page commentary. I mean a very erudite, as they would say, commentary by a very erudite man and scholar. And a Pentecostal speaks in tongues. He speaks in tongues on a regular basis. And so when he gets to this passage, do you know what he does with it? I could not believe it whenever I, this is a new commentary, it just came out this year. When he gets to this passage, he said that the way that we should deal with this is excise it. That means take it out of the Bible, verses 34 and 35. The reason, because some of the manuscripts don't have it, is a textual authority. There's no question about that. No, every single manuscript that has 1 Corinthians 14 has these verses in it. On what basis is he doing that? His own prejudice. And I just couldn't believe that the people who published those volumes would allow him to get away with that. I mean, you would expect him to say, now, it's not in Vaticanus, or it's not in Sinaiticus, or it's not here. You know, find something, some straw to grab a hold of, you know, some obscure text somewhere, maybe, that it's not in. It's in every single one, though. So nothing you can do. The best thing to do is leave it in and try to, you know, reinterpret it or something, but he knows he's up against the wall, because look how clear the wording is there. So he just excises it, and whenever you read the commentary, you go from verse 33 to verse 36. And then you get to the end, and he's got a little, you know, excursus or digression on what happened to those two verses. And he said, well, he said, they're just, we just don't believe that Paul could have said that. I mean, that's, that's his own fallible human reasoning. Now, he's got a reason. He said, because, you know, Paul said in chapter 11 that women can prophesy. So, obviously, they can speak in church. And so, rather than try to balance those and deal with the situation, you know, you know he cuts the Gordian knot and just says, well, there's no such thing as verses 34 and 35. We just don't believe that Paul could have said something like that. You have to know Paul very well, to know him so well, to know that he could not have said it. The only way that I know the Apostle Paul is by his writings here. I never met the man and talked to him personally where he told me that he allowed women to preach and ask questions in church. That's the only way you would know. You would have to have met Paul and know Paul that well. And we're 2,000 years removed, you see. The only way to know Paul is to know him through his writings, unless you have some visit by the Apostle Paul, and that would be suspect, or probably more than that, spurious, demonic, I would say. The saints don't appear to the people on the earth unless it's some very, you know, unusual thing, like Moses and Elijah returning. But Paul's not going to come back and say, now listen, I want to give you a little insight on this woman issue. I didn't say verses 34 and 35. Some later, you know, Roman Catholic monk stuck that in there or something in the transmission of the text. I just couldn't believe it, but you know, whenever you check his background, you find out assemblies of God. Oh, stands to reason then. You're not surprised anymore after all. Assemblies of God. They've got to defend their historic position that women are allowed to do more than the Bible says women are allowed to do. So that's one good example I should have given you, but I just neglected to. I ran out of time last time. Well, in verse 34, what's Paul mean here? They're commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. Well, there are a whole lot of interpretations over that last word, law. What's law mean? Old Testament, Pentateuch, creation narrative? Well, I believe it's obvious that in light of chapter 11 and in light of 1 Timothy 2, whenever Paul's going to deal with the woman issue, he's going to deal with it on the basis of something that's not Jewish by nature or Jewish by culture or Mosaic by institution or Sinaitic. He's going to deal with something that is Edenic. That means in the Garden of Eden. That's the way that it was and the way that it forever shall be. It's fixed and it's normative. I believe that he has reference again to the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. She's commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. So where does it say that? Well, it doesn't say it in so many words. But you can find other places in the New Testament where the New Testament authors are quoting from the old as said the prophet and it doesn't say that in so many words. I mean, it's not a direct quotation like the last verse in Matthew chapter 2. You've got to kind of put some of the pieces of the Old Testament together before you could find where Matthew is quoting when he said that the prophets have said this, that Jesus would be called a Nazarene. And then over in 1 Timothy chapter 2, finally, and we'll get into our study this evening, 1 Timothy chapter 2 I want to again point out the fact that Paul deals with this matter of women speaking and women in ministry from the point of view of Genesis. In other words, what I'm saying is that 
the teaching of the Old Testament and the teaching of the New Testament, not any perversions you might find in the Old or New, but the teaching of the Old and the teaching of the New Testament revolves around the axis of Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. They're fixed and they're normative. Anything apart from that or anything different from that is a diversion from the way that God originally intended for it to be. Now, we might have some cases where there is a diversion from that, uh, such as the Mosaic allowance. He didn't command this. It was just an allowance made for divorce in Deuteronomy 24. Whenever Jesus deals with that in Matthew 19, you know the religious leaders try to trip him up over that. And he said that um, from the beginning it was not so. And they said, well, wait a minute. You know, Moses allowed that. And Jesus tells them why. It was for the hardness of your own hearts. Amen. God allowed that. That wasn't God's best. That wasn't God's will. God's will during the whole period was one man and one woman for life until death do them part. One man and one woman. So, you might find some diversion somewhere, but it's because of the hardness of people's hearts or it's because of the deception of the devil that you'll find it, and divorce is one good case. Well, in 1 Timothy 2, starting with verse 11, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Now, I think we just read that over in 1 Corinthians 14. Let your women keep silence or keep silent in the churches, for it's not permitted to them to speak. For they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. If they have a question, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's a shame for a woman to speak in the church. I just quoted the verses to you again. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, and I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority, that is, to take the man's role or position, to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. There's that word again. For, now for means because, on this basis, for Adam was first formed, then Eve, that is the order of creation, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression, and that's the order of the fall. Due to the order of creation and due to the order of the fall. Now, where do you get that? Genesis chapters 1 and 2 for the order of creation, verse 13, and chapter 3 for the order of the fall, verse 14. You couldn't ask for anything clearer then this truth, that whatever Paul says about the roles of men and women, he's saying it's an eternal truth. It goes back to the very way in which God made man and woman. And there's no culture, there's no cross, there's no empty tomb, there's nothing that's going to do away with it. Or why wouldn't Paul say, now we realize how God made woman, but now that Jesus has resurrected from the dead, we know that women now are different. They're not. Nothing has changed in that regard. Nothing has changed in that regard. Genesis 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, they're still in effect. And you couldn't ask for anything clear that every time Paul deals specifically with this matter, first case, second case, and then if that's not enough, third case, he goes back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3 to show that it's fixed, it's normative, it's eternal, it's transcultural. That's the best argument that you could level against people who will say, well, now this was just a problem at Corinth, or this was a problem at Ephesus, or this was a problem over there. Say, but Paul said, in the beginning, this is the way that it was. Not because there were some deceiving Corinthian women or some noisy Ephesian women. There weren't any noisy or deceiving women in Genesis 1 and 2. There was just Eve in a good and pure and upright and righteous state. And yet it was still true. It still prevailed then. So the place where you have to start is where God starts in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. It's very appropriate to return to these chapters seeing that the Apostle Paul does whenever he deals with the matter. We would like to turn to 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2 to deal with the matter. And that's good. But that's just a stepping stone. Whenever you get into those passages, in order to understand them, you have to understand Paul's understanding of the matter. And in order to understand that, you've got to understand the passages that Paul was basing everything on. He's not basing 1 Corinthians 14 on 1 Corinthians 14. He's writing it. He's basing it on something else, namely on Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. 
So let me say again, there's something fixed and normative about creation that's applicable for today, forever, and that's an aid for discussing the roles of women in the church. Remember, we're in the studies from Colossians 2 and verse 5 that Paul is joining and beholding our order in the church. So women's roles in the church concern the question of order versus disorder. There is something fixed and normative about the creation narrative that's applicable today. It's not without purpose that God had us in a long, long study in those early chapters in Genesis several years ago because, and I said over and over and over and over again until I was blue in the face then that you won't know anything about anything if you don't start where it all began, in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. That's right. You won't know anything about anything. Why there are monkeys and whales and black people and yellow people and white people and red people and men and women and glaciers and rocks and deposits and you won't know anything about anything you won't have any answers to anything the sun the stars the red doppler effect you'll know nothing about anything if you don't start where god began one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven of genesis then you get into specific redemptive history with the call and election of the patriarch abraham and then you go from there to the hebrew race but those first 11 chapters deal with mankind in general you have no Hebrew race until Abraham is called. All right, so with that in mind, I'd like to return now to where Paul said everything begins and his understanding of, you know, of all things, his understanding of how the church of the risen Lord Jesus Christ should function and operate, his understanding of that all is based way back here in these, well, to many people, cobwebbed chapters, Genesis 1, 2, and 3. His understanding of what's going on after grace and after the cross and after Pentecost and after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and with Christian women who are baptized in the Holy Spirit, his understanding of how they should be goes all the way back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3. People come up with fancy interpretations for those passages over in the New Testament, but there's really nothing you're going to be able to do when you see that those don't stand alone those stand in a very vital relationship to the way it is. I mean, it's just the way that it is. God said, let us make man. He made a man, then he took a rib from the man and made a woman, and she was made for him, not vice versa. That's just the way that it is. There's nothing you're going to be able to do about that. You can fight it, you can fight against it, but you can't overthrow God, though. Amen. It'd be best just to take uh, Gamaliel's counsel and say, well, they got Scripture on their side. It seems to be working, so let's, you know, uh, cease from our activity against them lest happily we be found to fight even against God Amen. there's nothing you can do about our position except fight against it and to fight against that is to fight against not just God but you're fighting against the way that it is you can't change the way that it is you can't make a woman a man or a man a woman not with sex transplants and all of these perverse things that are being done Amen. All, in, all in the name of confusion right. which is what is governing the world right now you can't change the way that it is. You can fight against it. You can revolt. You can rebel. You can let your tongue walk up and down through the earth against it. But you can't do anything about the way that it is. Is is being. It is. That's just the way that it is. That's the way that it will forever be. And you can't do anything about you. You're either made a man, you're born one in this world, or you're born a woman. There's nothing you can do about that. That's the way that it is. What we have to do is find out well, now that I know who I am, I'm not an it or a he, she, she, him, her, thing, they, them, us, we. Now that I know who or what I am, I can start finding out what I'm supposed to be doing now. Now that I know who I am, now that I've made the grand discovery, hey, mom, I'm a boy, I'm a girl. I just found it out. Not in biology class, you found it out in church. I go to this church and they told me, hey, you're a boy, and hey, you're a girl, you're not a boy. I made this grand discovery. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A lot of people haven't made that discovery. They don't know what they are. Oh, my. He women and she men are just abounding around us like a zoo with these strange creatures around. <laughs> he women and she men. It's good whenever you get your eyes open and you make a discovery that you found out what you are after all. You know, back in the 60s, people were wondering, who am I? What am I? <laughs> well, now you know. 
And it was the drugs, you know, they're smoking too much weed, that made them kind of confused about who they were, <laughs> what they were. You get off the weed and get back down on planet Earth and you find out, or come to church, one or the other, <laughs> and you make this grand discovery, I'm boy! I girl, I Jane, I boy, I found out what I am. Now we get into the Word of God, we find out, now that you know who you are, what are you supposed to be like? Yeah, <laughs> Not if you're a woman! <laughs> <laughs> He's speaking for himself. That was a <coughs> husky voice, a deeper voice. Oh, my. Praise the Lord. Well, a little humor helps. There are three points I want to give you. We're just going to get into one of them, the first one tonight, and then, then our studies will go from there in the future. But there are, three there are three points. They come from chapters 1, 2, and 3, one per chapter. And... I think if you get these down, three items so clearly taught in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and so clearly supported in the rest of the Bible, the Old and the New Testament, then you'll be a long way on your way in understanding biblical roles for men and women, boys and girls. I think I'll give you the points so that I won't keep you in suspense, but we'll just spend time on one of them tonight. First of all, now this is going to say it all in these three magnificent points that we're going to give you. It's going to say it all. Chapter 1, verses 26 and 28 is our support for this. That there, the Bible teaches, there is a spiritual, a complete spiritual equality between man and woman. That's where the Bible starts, so that's where we start. There's a complete spiritual equality between man and woman. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. And let me just say also in advance that each of these points will be based on two subpoints. And again, they'll be found right here in our text. Each of these points will be based on two subpoints. I'll come back and give you those two for the first one when we get into that. And I'll save the other for the other later on. There's a complete spiritual equality between man and woman. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Secondly, this is from chapter 2, verses 15 through 25. There is a created masculine headship and functional female subordination taught by the Genesis narrative and supported by the rest of the Word of God. We just saw it in 1 Corinthians 11 and 14 and 1 Timothy 2, especially the first two passages. Well, you want that again? There, there is a created masculine headship. I say created because that's the way God has made man. Created. He made man and he made him first. And because he made him first, the very order of it would teach that man is head, man is leader. There's a created masculine headship and a functional female subordination. No sense in explaining all of what I mean by each of these things. We'll be getting to them later on. But you, you've got a dictionary. You've got one in your brain. You know what functional and female and subordination mean. I'm sure you can figure it out. Chapter 2, verses 15 through 25. Praise God. You see, I have the liberty to say these things in a body of people who believe the word of God. If you ask, well, what do you do if, if someone doesn't believe this? I don't know what you do because there's nothing you can do, nothing you can say to them. What if they don't like when you say that there is a functional female subordination? Well, I can't help if they don't like it. That's just the way that it is, and the Bible teaches that. That Adam was made first, and that the woman is commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. It says that over and over and over in the New Testament. As the Apostle Paul teaches that. So if you don't like the term submit, or obedience, or obey, or subordinate, or subordination, or uh, subjection. They're all used in the Bible. If you don't like those terms, you're just saying that you're not saved. You're not a Christian because you don't like the Holy Spirit's vocabulary. You don't like his choice of words. You'd rather him use something else that's smoother and easier to go down, easier to swallow. That's right. You're just saying that you either aren't a Christian or you, are, or you don't know the truth yet in this whole matter. If you don't like the words that the Holy Spirit said, this is what we're going to say. Created masculine headship and functional female subordination. 
And then if women don't like that, they're going to climb the walls over the third point. But it's again the way that it is. Notice where I started, and that's going to be the message tonight, back up on spiritual equality. And what I'll say there is that I would resist with just as much fervency anyone who would rob from a Christian woman what the Bible says is her right and duty and privilege and grace and gift. I would fight that just as much as I'd fight the opposite. Amen. You know, I would fight the unscriptural demeaning or unscriptural subjection and subordination of women just as fervently as I would fight their unscriptural exaltation. I'm opposed to anything that's opposed to God's word. I'm not, I'm not opposed to women. I'm opposed to anything that's opposed to God's word, which would include unscriptural subordination of women as well as unscriptural exaltation of women. But here's where it is in chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. If you don't like it, just stay with it anyway. Paul teaches it in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that there is emotional susceptibility, I won't say instability, <laughs> I've chosen my words carefully, I guess I ought to even steer clear of the word gullibility. That doesn't sound very good. So I'll say susceptibility. You know, if you're susceptible, it means that there's a possibility that you can be open for something. <laughs> Bible may, might even make it stronger, but there is an emotional susceptibility in woman that's not in man. Period. If you disagree with that, you disagree with the word of God. That's Genesis 3, that's 2 Corinthians 11, that's 1 Timothy chapter 2. Well, I bet he wouldn't be teaching all that stuff against women if he was a woman. That's right, because I wouldn't be allowed to teach as a woman. <laughs> I got you on that one, didn't I? Well, I bet he wouldn't believe all of that if he was a woman. I certainly would if it's taught in the Word of God, and I want to be in line with the Word of God. Well, I know some deceived men. Well, I do too. That's too bad. <laughs> But the Bible teaches in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, that there is an emotional, see, I didn't say spiritual or an intellectual deficiency. You know, you see, I, I've read a lot of books on this matter, and you get some old men who are just hair, hairy-chested, uh, chest-thumping patriarchs who make a woman into a slave, you know, that women are intellectually deficient and mentally unstable and you know, they just go down the list, and before you know it, you've got a moron or a Christian on your hands, someone that you ought to lock up in an institution. So I've read a lot of books, and you hear all these extremes of a woman glorified as the mother of heaven, you know, the goddess from above, everything from that to a woman who's mentally and spiritually and physically and domestically unstable and irrational and susceptible to every delusion and disease and deception around. And the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible has a balance that's somewhere in between. I wouldn't say that women are intellectually or morally deficient. When I say deficient, you say, well, thank you for saying that. Thank you for gracing us with that. Well, I wouldn't have to. That's just you. That's the way God has made you. You're not intellectually deficient or inferior to a man or morally inferior or spiritually inferior. But there is an emotional susceptibility, gullibility, instability that is in woman that is not in man. You say, well, why? Well, you have to ask God when you get to heaven about that. But, you know, I'm not in the business of asking, why, God? Why did you make me this way? Why, why, why? You know, because God may just reach down and give you a parental slap in the face for all that complaining in his ears. You know, you could be th saying, thank you, God, that you didn't make me a, a beast or an animal or a rock or a centipede, that I'm a woman, I'm a glorious, beautiful woman. I could be a centipede. Well, you could. He could have made you that, or a snail, or a turtle, or a tortoise, or a hare. You're a beautiful, glorious woman, or a handsome, strong man. You can praise God that he made you the way he made you. Hallelujah. Emotional susceptibility. Well, you see, Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6 who did the devil come to through the serpent? Did he come to the woman or did he come to the man? There must be a story in that then, friends. See, I'm not making any of this up. These are the three points and everything in Scripture concerning roles will revolve around. These are the three and the only three. I only know of three, and there are these three right here. There are three and only three. But the role issue, the role question, revolves around this axis of Genesis 1, 2, and 3. 
just so you can hear it again tonight. Spiritual equality, functional subordination, emotional susceptibility. Of course, we're presenting it from the female's point of view, from the woman's point of view. Spiritual equality, female subordination, in a functional sense, and emotional susceptibility. Now, not only you see is this my opinion, and it is my opinion, and I'm not ashamed of that, it's my opinion, that the devil came to Eve first because he knew he could get to her easier, quicker, maybe he could just get to her, period, than he could Adam, or that he couldn't get to Adam at all. He knew he could get to Eve, and he didn't think he'd get to Adam. He's so wild. Remember, he's more subtle than all the beasts of the field. He didn't just throw his wisdom out there and not use it. His wisdom was not for naught. This is this wise created being called Lucifer over there in Isaiah chapter 14. The wise one of, of Ezekiel 28, his wisdom wasn't for naught. It didn't have go for no effect here. This is a wise, subtle, crafty being called the devil, Lucifer, Satan, working through the serpent here. Well, I just believe that Eve was one available there. Well, you're not thinking very much. The devil's smarter than that. He's not going to just pick whichever one's available knowing that the one who happens not to be available is more susceptible. He went to the one that he knew he could deceive or thought that he had the best chance at deceiving. Now, that, that is not simply my opinion. It is mine, but not, it's not only my opinion. It's not my opinion only. The Apostle Paul says the same thing. The man was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. We just read it in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Not only the order of creation, but the order of the fall. Teach us something about the priority of the roles and the sexes. The man was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. 1 Timothy 2. So, those three points, everything you see is going to revolve around that. Spiritual equality, created masculine headship, functional female subordination, and thirdly, from chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, the fact that the devil through the serpent came to Eve first teaches us something about the way that she was made, that she is emotionally susceptible, or you could say gullible. I prefer the term susceptible. It's just a better... It's a better rounded term. It's a fuller, more complete, more accurate term, I think, than gullible. She's susceptible. There's an emotional susceptibility present in the makeup of a woman that is not there in a man. Now, you see, the marvel of marvels is how would we even know these things? How would you know these various things unless either A or B took place? A, God just gave you in Genesis 3.1, now, the woman is more susceptible than the man. Or B, he gave it to you in the form of a story. Didn't Jesus teach things with maybe a lengthy parable where you could have kind of gotten to the end and said, now this is it right here. You could have said it in a sentence, but he taught it in a story. How about the neighbor business in Luke chapter 10? Someone asked him, you know, who's my neighbor? And he gave him a story of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Well, he could have just said, here's the answer, and he did at the end. But he told it to him in a story. Why? A story is richer. It's fuller. It's more complete. It can bring dimension to the topic under consideration that a didactic instruction, plain one sentence pure teaching, simply cannot impart. God could either have given us A, said the woman is susceptible, she's gullible, she's supposed to be subordinate and all this, or he could have told us in a roundabout way through a story. And I'm saying how we know these things except as you get into the Word of God and you read this account, and then don't just read it like, well, now I know Genesis 3 that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field and he came and said, now the Lord God talked about the Lord God to the woman. The woman got deceived and then Adam came and Adam bit into some red or golden delicious apple and he sinned and then that was the end of it all. Or that was the beginning of it all. The end of man, the beginning of the story of redemption. So that's it right there. Well, think about what you're reading. Well, I mean, God only has so many chapters, friends, or you're going to have to have a moving van carrying the Bible around. He's only got so much space, and it's already a big book. You know that and how long it takes you to get through it. You don't read it like cliff notes at night before you go to bed or something. He's only got so much space to give us the information whenever he takes up whole chapters on something. Hey, that's important. That's very important. 
And he told us a story. He told us a story behind the story by giving us a story in the first place. He told us a story behind the story. Now here's woman. Here's woman. He presented woman. He presented a little portrait, a little picture of woman. Here's woman by giving us the devil tempting the woman through the snake in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Here's woman. Here's a portrait of woman. Verse 6, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. And she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave to her husband and he ate. You have a little teaching there, but I would say more than teaching, you have the story presented in the story, the story behind the story. The story behind the story is, well, what is a woman? What makes woman different than man? Where do they differ besides in the obvious ways? Where do they differ? Well, they don't differ spiritually. They're equal in that regard. The Bible is clear there. There's equal access to the throne of grace. There's equal access in prayer, equal access in salvation, equal access in the baptism in the Holy Spirit, equal access in all of those regards. She's going to be held morally, spiritually, scripturally accountable for her beliefs. She won't stand under the shadow of her husband or whatever. Every man will be judged according to his own works. And every man means every man and woman and boy and girl. They'll be judged according to their own works. So they're spiritually equal, but yet we know that there are various ways in which they are not, quote, equal. If you don't like that term, then just say the negative that there are differences involved besides the obvious ones. And we're, we're not some, uh, we're, not, we're not going to get into what other people have tried to do a study of and show now, are there intellectual differences? Because that's really not a concern of ours. I don't really think that there are intellectual differences between man and woman. By that I mean that maybe a man is capable of of learning more or having a higher intellect than a woman. I don't think that's true. But I don't want to, and I think I can prove that by virtue of our discussion of spiritual equality. But I don't even want to get into all of that because that's not really the issue that we're discussing now. It's the role of a woman, not what capacities she has or doesn't have or what ability she has or doesn't have. It's obvious that because of her physical makeup, she has certain limitations when it comes to strength that a man doesn't have. I mean, her threshold for strength in many different ways, I'm talking about in the physical area, is a lot lower. Her threshold level is a lot lower than a man's. But those are the obvious things. Those are also things we're not going to discuss. The way the body is made, the shapes, the parts, the strength, the shapes, you know, the cheekbone to the arm to the slender fingers or, you know, whatever it is. And the obvious parts, the shapes are different. Physical strength is different. What about the brain? What about the spirit? What about the, the internal whatever? What about the essence of it all? Well, God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And so God made man in his own image and he made woman also. And he said, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and the cattle and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and so forth. So there are various ways in which the genders are equal and various ways in which they differ. And there's another passage I would like to turn to. I, I don't know that I'm going to have enough time to get into the study tonight. <laughs> Praise the Lord. If we go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, one passage that we haven't read yet. It's really not a section dealing with. That's why I haven't I didn't include it with the three big passages of 1 Corinthians 11 and 14 and 1 Timothy 2. It's not really a passage or a section dealing with the question of roles. It's not really dealing with that. You know, you can, obviously, you can tell that obviously 1 Corinthians 11 and 14 and 1 Timothy 2 are that. They are dealing with roles. Women teaching or women speaking or women wearing a head covering versus men speaking, women, men teaching, men wearing a head covering. It's obvious that there is that situation on our hands. Now, in 2 Corinthians 11, we're not discussing roles here, but we are discussing the false apostles and false ministers. And uh, if they're false, that means there's going to be deception in their teaching. There's going to be evil leaven there. The devil, Satan, verse 14, the angel of light, he himself is the one behind it all. But I'd like you to notice that in 2 Corinthians 11, beginning with verse 1, that whenever Paul talks about deception, that's what he's talking about here in this part of the chapter. When he talks about deception, 
Guess whose name pops up as the one who was susceptible? Eve. E-V-E. Good old Eve. I used to have a girlfriend named Eve. Praise God my name wasn't Adam. There would have been no end to the jokes, I'm sure. It's not maybe the best name for your daughter, Eve, the mother of all living, yeah, but the mother of all sin, too. Well, so was Adam, so maybe Adam isn't. Oh, I don't care. It doesn't bother me about that. Eve is a pretty name. I only had two girlfriends. One of them I finally ended up marrying. <laughs> that was the second one. Praise God it wasn't the first one. <laughs> Got them in the right order. But I only had two. One of them's the one I married to. Praise God for that. The other one I'm glad I didn't marry because she never came into the truth. Got saved and I tried to share the baptism with her, but oh, she had some worldly desires, career oriented and things like that and never got into it. But her name was Eve. We went through the jokes though, you know, Adam and Eve. Well, here comes Adam and Eve, you know, down the school hall. This was way back when, you know, 11, 12, 13 years old. Here comes Adam and Eve. <laughs> and we were in a Christian school, you see, so it was real fitting. It was real fitting to refer to Bible topics and themes and characters. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my fall and indeed bear with me, for I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Well, you see, the church is often spoken of as a woman or a bride or a virgin. And that would include men and women, of course that I may present you to one husband. Well, that's Jesus Christ, of course. We know he's maleness and masculine, so that only leaves one thing for us to be. We, we don't have a pick. We're female, all of us, in that regard. We're his bride, praise the Lord. But I fear, look at verse 3, but I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. Didn't Moses tell us now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field? Genesis 3, 1, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. It means the devil working through the serpent. I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled. Beguile means to trick, to deceive, to seduce, spiritually speaking here. E, through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, obviously, of course, he's writing to a group called the church at Corinth that is comprised of men and women, and he's afraid that their minds, that means all of their minds, men and women, could be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. So that certainly could be the case where men could be deceived. Uh, so this verse uh, in, in 2 Corinthians 11, this verse, the first part of it, is really the part that applies with what we're studying now because when you take this and go over then to 1 Timothy 2, then Paul's building a whole case on uh, Adam was first formed and then Eve. And Adam, the man, was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. He makes a big deal about that. And Paul is making something about it here, although the context is different. We certainly wouldn't go so far as to deny the fact that a man could be deceived. Oh, wouldn't you be deceived to deny that? Jesus told his own apostles, you know, take heed, beware, lest any man deceive you by any means. The devil is capable of deceiving anyone. That's not the point. He's capable of deceiving anyone. But there are some people that because of who they are, they can't help it. That's the way God has made them. They are emotionally susceptible in a way that a man isn't. And the Bible has that to say over and over again. You say, well, what's the big deal about all of this? Well, we're running out of time, but let me say it this way. Here's what the big deal is. Because of the fact that the woman is susceptible in a way in which the man isn't, she cannot have positions of authority over the church because that's dealing with eternal matters and people's eternal souls. If she's going to be wrong, let her be wrong about cooking vegetables or canning fruits or something. Don't let her be wrong and teach the house of God. Well, I know some men who are wrong. Oh, I do too. The devil is a master deceiver. He can deceive. He is capable of deceiving all people, men and women. So you see, this is kind of a halfway situation here. God's not saying, well, because a man is not capable of being deceived, and that's why we're going to let him have positions of authority. That's not what God is saying. He never presents it from that point of view. You never come at it from that angle. Because a man isn't capable, he isn't susceptible to deception, then that's why we allow him to be an authority in the church. It's not presented that way. It's presented from this way, because a woman is more emotionally susceptible than a man. 
or at least she should be, or most women are, than most men, because she is more. Then here's a safeguard God takes over his creation, and a safeguard he takes specifically when we get to what we're studying now, divine order in the church, a safeguard that God insists upon over his church. Now you see, because we have our minds renewed by the word of God, we're washed clean by the water of the word, because our minds are renewed, then we think the right way here. That it is wrong for a woman to lead men. That's wrong. That's unnatural. It's perverse. It's wicked. And it's out of the divine order. Someone has gotten out of their role. And someone is allowing someone to get out and to remain out of their role. That's only because, friends, we have our minds renewed here. Or maybe because you were brought up the right way and you just didn't really cotton to the idea of a woman standing up there lecturing you about something. It just didn't feel right to you. Well, if it didn't feel right, then those feelings you were getting were right feelings. You were right. Or if you were a woman and you just didn't like a woman teaching you, or if you were a woman and you were required to teach somewhere and you just didn't like the feeling of it, those feelings you were getting were right. Those were feelings that sprang out of your innermost being. They were you as God made you. Eve back in the garden. 